Um, so yeah, I should probably introduce myself for those of you who don't know me yet. Um, my name is uh, Jarno Vanderkoek and I'm the Senior Scientific Computing Specialist at the University of Ottawa. Uh, so that means I help people get access to these high performance computing resources, uh, but they can also help if you want to buy your own server or if you have your own server and you want to get it installed in our data center. Uh, I can also help with um, like making your code more efficient. So if you're programming and you want to make it like parallel code, I can help with that as well. Uh, and also the other thing I do is the seminars. Uh, so today we'll talk about uh, well high performance computing. So let me just share my screen again. Let's see, looks like it's shared. So that's good. So, uh, high performance computing. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, um, a vague term because what does high performance computing really mean? Like what is high performance? And it also changes uh, every day. Like your own computer gets stronger and stronger. So what was high performance computing like a decade ago isn't really high performance computing these days. Uh, so these are just some indications of what high performance computing could be. So if you have a program that uses a lot of memory, so more than 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, most desktop computers these days have eight gigabytes, although there's many with 16. And if you need more than that, you'll need a more powerful machine. So that would be high performance computing. There's also programs that process a lot of data. So if you are working with hundreds of gigabytes of data or even terabytes of data, then high performance computing is also uh, something you could outsource to a compute cluster. Uh, if you require a lot of processors or if you just have one single program that you need to run many, many times, for instance, if you need to do a parameter sweep and you have one program that does a simulation, but you need to do it like a thousand times, then you can run all of those programs at the same time. And it's also just programs that just take a really, really long time to run, which wouldn't be really handy to have that done on your desktop computer because it needs to be on all the time. And even if you have just a bit of all of these, then yeah, that counts as high performance computing. So this session is really two sessions. So the first part is a general info session where I talk about what's available and how to use it. And then the second part is an interactive session where I'll walk you through uh, how to submit jobs to a compute cluster and basically how to get started with all of this. Um, if you're all only interested in a general info, feel free to quit, of course, before the interactive session. And if you want to stay for the interactive sessions, that's great. <laughs> so what's available out there? Um, Actually, I should probably also say that if you have any questions, uh, I can't see the chat, but I have to force myself to look at it. Uh, you can also just unmute yourself and ask questions anytime you want. So just so you know. <laughs> uh, so what's out there? So we have access to a really, really fast network. Uh, it's called Orion or Canary, um, depending if you're looking at the provincial level or the uh, Canada-wide level. And there's also a lot of computing resources out there. So Compute Canada is one of the, the biggest ones, uh, one of the biggest free ones, I should say. <laughs> and then there's Salskip, which is more for um, academic industry, academic uh, academy, academic industry relations. <laughs> and of course, there's a commercial cloud that you've probably heard for before, like it has Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon, uh, it has AWS, there's Google Cloud. Or cloud and there's a bunch of others as well. And the other big resource that is available out there is our resource data center. And you can buy your own physical server and place that in your cent in our data center. And that's also free. I mean, the server is not free, but the hosting is free. So Orion Canary, uh, it's a really, really fast network. So it's about 100 gigabit per second and it connects all of the, the institutions in uh, Canada. So the map on the left is uh, Orion. So that's uh, the Ontario network. And on Orion is part of Canary. So if you take all these provincial networks and you tie them all together, uh, that's Canary. So this means that you can have a really, really fast link to any research institution and any of the compute clusters that are part of um, 
compute Ghana and Soskip. And even uh, it goes outside of uh, Ghana. So Canary in turn connects to the worldwide network with uh, really big pipes. So you'll have a very fast connection to anywhere in the world. Uh, the University of Ottawa is connected to Orion and currently at 40 gigabit per second, uh, but it's getting faster all the time and 40 gigabit per second is still really, really fast. <laughs> so then there is a uh, compute Ghana and they provide uh, like free computational resources. So you don't have to pay anything to use these services and what is available is really quite big. So they have four national sites where they have uh, massive compute clusters. So there's Cedar, which is uh, almost 95,000 cores and more than a thousand GPUs. Uh, there's Graham, which is a bit smaller, but it's still 40,000 CPUs and 500 GPUs. <laughs> and then there's Niag uh, Niagara. Uh, that's a compute cluster that specializes in jobs that require lots of CPUs. So they have a lot of CPUs, uh, but they don't have any GPUs. And then there's Beluga, and that one tends more to uh, GPU usage. So if you have um, machine learning or whatever, you might want to uh, choose Beluga because they have access to a lot of GPU devices compared to the number of cores they have. And you can use any of these clusters and you can use all of them at the same time as well. Uh, and then there's also Arbutus, and, and that's the, the virtual machine infrastructure. So if you cannot use the compute clusters, uh, there are a few reasons for that. I'll get into that later. Uh, then you can start your own virtual machine and do your own thing there. And that's also completely free. So Compute Canada in itself is a collaboration between various consortia. So there's Westgrid for the four Western provinces. And then there's us, which we are part of Compute Ontario. And then there's Calculi Quebec, and then there's HNet for the Atlantic provinces. And the reason that it's all free is because all of Compute Canada is paid for by CFI and also provincial grants. And they also get money, well, not money from vendors, they get in kind contributions from vendors. So they get equipment at discounted prices. And if, for example, you look at Cedar, uh, Cedar is located in Westgrid. Uh, Graham and um, what's the other one? Oh, Niagara, uh, Graham and Niagara, they're both are located in uh, Compute Ontario. And then there's Beluga, and that's a cluster that is in Calculi, Quebec. Uh, ACENET doesn't have its own really big national site, uh, but there's still some clusters there that uh, you can all use. So it really doesn't matter where these clusters are located. Like you can use the Compute Resources of Westgrid or Compute, Canada, sorry, Compute Ontario. Uh, it doesn't matter what you use uh, because it's all part of Compute Canada. And if you want to use Compute Canada, uh, you require a Compute Canada account. And you can apply for an account if you go to the website here, which is uh, ccdb.computecanada.ca. Uh, if you go to that website, there's a link that says register, and then you can register uh, for an account. So if you're a PI, and uh, then you can register and Compute Can I will confirm with uh, UOttawa that you're indeed a professor here and then your account is approved and you're up and running in one, maybe two business days. And it helps a lot if you use your institutional email address. So if you use your at uottawa.ca address, um, that will make it go faster. And then when you have an account as a PI, you can get an account. So then your students and postdocs and anybody in your group really they can uh, request an account as well, and they can put you down as a, a sponsor. And for them, it also takes like one or two uh, business days. And then you'll get an email saying, this uh, person wants to have access under your account. Do you allow that? And then you say yes. And then you have to do that every year to renew their accounts. Uh, but you'll get an automatic email. So you get an email with a link saying, uh, is this person still in your group? And you click yes, and then you're done for another year. And then there is Soskip as well. So Soskip is more uh, for the industry academic collaboration. So if you have a project uh, that requires an industrial partner, so it's not purely research, but it's more like research in making something commercial, uh, then you may be better off with uh, Soskip. 
uh, Sauscape and Compute can uh, actually use quite a bit of the same infrastructure. So I think Sauscape uses a lot of uh, the Niagara cluster. Uh, but Sauscape is nice because it gives you uh, more priority access. So if you have a compute job you want to run, it will generally be processed faster if you use Sauscape. Uh, however, Sauscape is not free. Uh, you have to apply. And if your application is successful, then you have to pay a, a small fee to get access to their resources. I think it's $5,000 for two years, which is really cheap considering for what you get. So with Sauskip, um, I actually copied this from their flyer. <laughs> so with Sauskip, you get uh, like the next generation of high qualified personnel. So that is true for both Sauskip and Compute Canva and the commercial cloud and your own research cluster. Uh, your own research server. So all these um, technologies, they require some degree of training. So you'll get uh, more knowledgeable students and postdocs that way. Um, but they also, Soscope also helps a lot with uh, exploring ways to commercialize your research. So they can help you set up with uh, industry partners. They can help you uh, get your technology out there and make it commercial. So that's kind of this slide. So they help develop uh, partnerships. Uh, they also help you find uh, funding partners. So even though you have to pay uh, a small uh, application fee, sorry, not an application fee, you have to pay a small fee after your application is successful, uh, they'll find money for you. And so in effect, you'll <laughs> be out positive. And they also have uh, great uh, technical support. So they have dedicated staff that is just there to help you get started on Sauscape. And if you run into troubles, they can help you uh, with that as well. Uh, Compute Canada does that as well, but they're much bigger. So Compute Canada is much bigger. <laughs> and so if you want to apply for this, uh, there's an email address here that you can use. Uh, you can also use that to ask questions, of course. And the director and the technical uh, staff of, uh, of Sauskip, uh, they are giving a seminar uh, October 21st. So they'll host a seminar uh, that we organized together with them. And you can register at that link below. Uh, I'll send you the slides for this out uh, afterwards. So you don't have to write it down, but you can just click on the link in the PDF and I sent it. So if you want to know no more about Sauskip, um, you'll get it from the the horse's mouth, I think the expression is, uh, if you go to that session as well. So then there's also the commercial cloud. So like I said, there is many, many of these, like there's Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon, Google, Oracle. Um, there's a few other smaller ones that I can't remember right now. Uh, but yeah, the advantage of that is that you get uh, full control. So you really get the whole package. So you get virtual machines or you get other resources and you can configure them exactly the way you want them. So with clusters like uh, Sauscape or with Compute Canva, uh, everything is already up and running. So you don't need to do anything. Uh, but that also constrains you a bit if you want to, um, like for instance, push, uh, get like 10 virtual machines and put them all together and play with load balancing and other stuff like that. Uh, another uh, advantage of that is that you have no wait time. So with Compute Canada and with Sauskip, less so with Sauskip, but you still have to wait for space to become available for your compute jobs to be processed. And if you're with the commercial clouds, uh, you're paying them for direct access, access so you can start right away. Um, but of course, you have to pay money for these services and the pricing is a bit, um, well, it's not very transparent at times. So you pay for a lot of things separately, like you can pay for bandwidth use. So if you upload data, you pay a certain fee. Then if you download data, you pay a different fee, which is usually higher because they want your data to stay with them and not get out anymore because then, well, they have you as your customer. Uh, and they pay per CPU usage, so the more you use, the higher it gets. And if you have a job that takes a lot longer than you expected, you may end up with a higher bill. And another thing is that depending on the cloud, uh, your data may up in the US. So that could be a trouble for some grants where the data needs to stay in Canada. 
Uh, most clouds allow you to offer, allow you to select which region you want to use, uh, but some regions are quite broad, so it would have to be like North America. And then finally, there is uh, the physical server as well. So we have a data center in uh, Marion, uh, Marion Hall on our campus, and you can buy a server and then we will install it in our data center. Uh, it's a secure facility in that uh, it has a, a locked door and you need electronic key card to access it. Um, we also provide free electricity. Uh, we provide a free cooling. So our cooling, we have a great uh, cooling system in there that keeps your server at a, a low temperature, which in turn extends its lifetime. So the cooler computer is, the, the longer it will live basically, and the less faults it will develop. Uh, we have a deal with Dell that if you buy a service from Dell, they will give us the educational discount. And if you mail them directly for a quote, you can usually uh, get a bit more as well. Uh, but you're not uh, stuck to Dell. So if you want to use another vendor like, um, for instance, QNAP or that's more for storage or Microway, something like that, uh, that also works. Uh, the thing about a physical server, though, is that it belongs to you. So that means that you're responsible for it. Uh, if it breaks, uh, it's on you to fix it. Um, yeah, and you need to install uh, the software updates and all that stuff. We can definitely help with that, by the way. So you're not completely on your own, <laughs> uh, but it's more like a, a best effort thing. So we'll try to help you and fix it. Uh, but if for some reason it's totally broken, then yeah, it's still your serve. <laughs> So there are a few requirements for that. Uh, the server needs to be rack mounted. And that's uh, what that means. It's that's the, the shape of the server. So it needs to be a certain size and it needs to have uh, rails on the side that you can just slide in these cabinets. I have a picture here on the right. So it, it has to be rack mounted. You cannot put in a tower server or a desktop. It has to be that specific form shape, uh, that specific shape. And you also need to have a technical person associated with it. Uh, so that can be a student in your group, it can be yourself, um, doesn't really matter. It just needs to be somebody with access to the server and that's able to install the updates and stuff like that. And then there's two more, they're not quite requirements, but they're extremely recommended. Uh, the first is that you have redundant power. So that means that you have two power supplies in your server, and then if one fails, uh, the other will take over, so your server won't go down. And RAID, uh, that's for the hard drives, so that's a redundant array of independent disks. And that means that one or maybe even two hard drives can fail, and your server won't really care. It will just happily go on with whatever it was doing. Uh, it will send you an email saying, hey, this hard drive is dead. Uh, please replace it, and then you just slot it in, and then it's good to go again. And for some servers, depending on what type you have, you don't even need to turn it off to insert a new hard drive. Uh, but if you're thinking about buying a physical server, um, you should really contact us before purchasing it. So we can make sure that it actually uh, works well with our data center. Like there's a, a few small things, like our data center runs on 250 volt instead of 120 that you normally get for the outlet. Uh, we have special uh, power cables. Uh, there need to be rails, like there's all these tiny little things that we need to make sure that are right. So yeah, really contact us before you purchase a physical server and we'll help you. We can also help you with, um, if you want to buy a server, but you don't really know what you want yet. So I can talk to you about your project and then make an estimate of uh, what is needed for it. So that's really all the available resources that uh, we have for uh, computations. So how does it actually work? Um, so this stuff I'm going to talk about now, it applies mostly to Compute Canna and to Suscript clusters. But in many cases, it also applies to uh, your own server or uh, the commercial clouds. Because most times when you connect to a remote machine, it will be through SSH, which is the, the secure shell. 
So that's an encrypted connection uh, to the server of your choice. And you log in and then you get something that you can see here on the right. So that is in most cases the Linux shell. Uh, Compute Canada and probably also Saskip. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I'm 90% sure about it. Uh, they don't support any Windows at all. Uh, Compute Canada had some in the past for virtual machines, but it hasn't been used for, for about five years, I guess. So it's tricky to get Windows on these clusters. So Linux is really uh, the standard that you have. If you buy your own server, I would also recommend installing Linux on it, unless you have a specific piece of software that cannot run on Linux. Uh, so yeah, you get uh, access to the Linux shell. So you need to know how to uh, write commands to uh, submit jobs and how to navigate to different directories and things like that. Uh, to transfer files to uh, Compute Canada and Suskip, uh, you'll either use F SFTP, which is uh, sh the Secure File Transfer Protocol, uh, or you can use Globus. Uh, Globus is a bit tricky to set up, but it's about twice as fast as SFTP. So if you have a large data set, I would use uh, Globus. And for all the other stuff, I just use would use SFTP. And then for Compute Can and Southscape specifically, uh, most software is pre-installed. And there's also many different versions of that software installed. So if you need Python 3.7, it's there. If you need uh, MATLAB, uh, it's there. If you need, I don't know, uh, all these software is there. <laughs> Um, so if you want to use commercial software, uh, like MATLAB, like I just mentioned, uh, it's there too. Uh, but you do need uh, access to a licensed server. So if you want to run commercial software and you have a licensed server running here at UOttawa, uh, you can talk to us and we can connect it to uh, the Compute Canada cluster of your choice. And then when you run that software on, uh, in this case, Cedar, uh, it will phone home to you, Ottawa, uh, uh, checks out the license, and then does its thing. Uh, but yeah, that's not automatic. For the commercial software, you do need to co contact us. But for all the open, software, open source software, you can just load it, and it's good to go. Uh, in the interactive part later on, I'll get back to it, uh, and we'll see how that works. So the software that you, you need to have on your own computer, you need to have the SSA client, which you need to connect to this cluster in the first place. And you need the SFTP client, uh, which you need to uh, transfer data back and forth. So if you're on Linux or Mac OS, then you're already done. Um, they both come with an SSH client and an SFTP client. So you're already good to go. Uh, Windows is uh, less geared for this sort of stuff. So you need to download some program. Uh, on the left, I've put some programs that you can use. So Mobile Xterm is a pretty popular one. It does both file transfer and uh, it gives you access to the SSH um, Linux shell. So it gives you access to the Linux shell on the server. Uh, there's also PuTTY, which is as bare bones as you can get. It does SSH and only SSH. And Microsoft also has this neat feature um, Oh, I just noticed a question from three minutes ago. Uh, Carlos is asking, uh, which distribution do you recommend? Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, let me just answer that right now. It also depends a bit on your workload. Like for the clusters, it's always CentOS. Um, it's derived from Red Hat, which is the, the commercial uh, Linux version. And it's really stable, uh, but the disadvantage of that is that the software may be a bit old. Uh, the other big one is Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu is more up to date, and they also have a lot of uh, machine learning tools in them. So if you're into machine learning, then I would uh, recommend using Ubuntu. Um, otherwise, you can use um, CentOS. It kind of depends on your project. And yeah, if you want to really get down to it, you can contact me uh, afterwards and we'll get uh, through the details for your project. And then we can find what uh, distribution is best for you. Okay. Um, so yes, mobile Xterm, 
Oh, wait, sorry, I was at Ubuntu. <laughs> so Microsoft Store in Windows, it has this neat feature where you can go to, like the program is called the Microsoft Store, and you can actually download Ubuntu from there. And Ubuntu is a type of Linux, and you can install that in Windows, and then you get the Linux shell inside of Windows. So it will have the same commands as you would have on the remote computers. So you can play with your software in your own computer and make everything work in a Linux shell. And then when you're ready, you can send it over. And you also get access to the SSH client and the SFTP clients. So that's a nice option there to have. Uh, then for the file transfer, uh, I mentioned MobileX term for Windows. Uh, there's also two programs called uh, Cyberduck and FileZilla. They are um, they're GUI based, so they have uh, an interface that you can click and you can drag and drop files from there. So they're generally a bit easier to work with. So FileZilla is an open source program. I think Cyberduck is as well. And they're available for Linux and Mac OS and Windows. So if you prefer to have a GUI based uh, file transfer program, uh, you can pick either one of those. So this is the loading of the software part. So I mentioned before that uh, Soskip and Compute Canada, they have all the software available for you, uh, but they also have very many versions of that, um, that software available. So like I mentioned Python before, uh, you can choose Python 2.7, Python 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. Uh, it's all there. So that's really nice if you have code uh, that runs on an old version of the software, but not on a new version, then you can just go back to the old one. It's, well, Python is pretty backwards compatible, so you probably won't have that problem unless you go from version three to two. Uh, but for instance, for MATLAB, you can go to get version 2016 or version 2017, etc. And the screenshot on the right is where I have the command uh, module. And if I type module list, it will tell me all the modules that are currently loaded. So in this screenshot, I have the Intel 20, 2016 compilers loaded. I have Octave, I have Java. So I've loaded all these modules, and that means that they are available for my command line. So I could type Octave, and I would get Octave version 3.2.1, and I can run my simulations with that. Uh, so module is a really nice program that's available in the Linux shell when you're logged into Compute Canada or uh, Soskip. And then we get to the running of job parts, and this is the the most tricky bit about getting started with Compute Canada or with Soskip. Uh, because most people are used to running their software on a computer. Uh, you click the button or you type the command and it starts immediately. And then it keeps going until it's done. Uh, that doesn't quite work for these big clusters because you share them with uh, so many other people. Uh, you can imagine if you have your own computer and you start uh, 20 programs at the same time, that your computer will be decidedly unhappy with you for doing that. It will run out of memory, uh, it will become super, super slow, and all these programs are trying to get the resources that they want and they cannot get. So that doesn't really work. So the way that uh, Compute Canada and Soscape get around this is they use uh, a queuing system. So you have this big program, it's called uh, the scheduler, and you submit your job, to the scheduler, and then the scheduler holds your job until space is available on any of its compute nodes. And you're basically placed in the queue. And the amount of time that you wait in the queue, uh, it depends on how much you ask for. Because you can imagine if you're asking for like 20 gigabytes of RAM or 100 gigabytes of RAM, then the scheduler needs to find uh, a space where it can put that job. And the bigger your job, the harder it is to fit in there. So the longer you wait. And that's also true for the number of CPUs, uh, but also the amount of time that you are requesting. So that's also something that you really need to uh, think about. So if you submit your program, you have to sort of already have an idea of how much memory it will use, uh, how many CPUs it needs. 
and also very important how long do you think it will take um, these are all parameters that you need to give to the scheduler before it accepts your job uh, this can be hard to estimate like if you run your program um, you generally de don't really know how much memory it uses uh, so the way I usually recommend this is if you run your program on your own computer, uh, you can check the memory usage uh, and use that as a, uh, as a parameter when you submit your job. Uh, if your job is just too big to run on your own computer, uh, another way of doing this is to submit a job and ask for way more than you think you need. <laughs> So if your program, you estimate that ah, this is probably going to use, I don't know, 10 gigabytes, then you ask for 20 gigabytes. And if you think like, uh, I don't know how long it will take, maybe one day, then you ask for two days and then you should make your job. And then when your job has run, run then afterwards you check how much it actually used. And it's highly likely you'll want to change some parameter and run that job again. But now you know how much that job will take, so you can adjust your ask for the next time. So yeah, then your job is in the queue. Uh, it's waiting for all these resources to be available. And then once it's done, um, your job changes into the running state. So what that means is that uh, these clusters you can imagine as uh, one head computer that has a scheduler, and then there's all these uh, compute clusters, sorry, compute servers underneath it. And the scheduler picks one of these compute servers and sends your job to it and it starts it. So your job is now running on one of these compute servers. There may be other jobs as well on the compute server, but it's it all fits. So if all the jobs in total ask for 32 CPUs, then that server will only use those 32 CPUs. So then your job runs. And then it runs until either your job is done or it could fail. So it could fail if um, if there was an error in your program and it just crashes, or if you put an error in your input configuration that is is uh, invalid, then you run your program and the program reads in the configuration and it sees that's not valid and it stops immediately. So then you've waited all this time for nothing. <laughs> so that sucks a bit, but so to avoid that, you need to make sure that your input files is correct. So you can try it with a smaller version on your own computer, for instance. Uh, the other way your jobs can fail is if you ask for more memory. Oh, sorry, if your program asks for more memory than you asked of the scheduler. So what I mean by that is suppose you submitted your job and you say, oh, this job only requires one gigabyte of memory. And then your program runs and it tries to allocate 1.0001 gigabyte of memory. Well, that's more than one gigabyte. So the scheduler sees that and says, hey, that's not gonna fly. And it kills your job instantly. Like the scheduler really has no mercy. Uh, the same for time. If you say, oh, this job takes uh, an hour. And then if your job is still running after an hour, even if it's 99% complete, it just kills it because you exceeded your time. So you always need to put in a bit of buffer. So if you know that your program uh, needs 10 gigabytes of memory, just ask for 11. So you have a bit of buffer. If you know your program runs for uh, three days, then ask for three days and half a day, for instance. So it does increase your wait time a tiny bit, but that's nothing compared to having your job fail uh, when it's 99% complete and you have to redo it all over again. Uh, let's see, I see a question in the chat. Sorry, um, the chat is on a different program because here I'm just looking at my own presentation. <laughs> uh, Tao is asking, does it have debug nodes which run smaller jobs with limited running time? Uh, yes, that's correct. So Compute Canada and Southscape as well, they have a special queue. Um, I think it's called the debug queue. I forget what the name is, but they have uh, a separate queue. You can submit your job to that and it will run instantly. But the catch is that you can only run anything on there for half an hour. They also have interactive nodes. So instead of submitting your job and then um, 
yeah, instead of submitting a job and then just waiting for it to complete, you can also ask for an interactive job. So you submit and with a special command, you ask for an interactive job, then it returns you a shell. It's the same shell that you get for the login uh, computer, but it's uh, it's on that physical compute cluster, it's a compute server itself. So you can run your commands as if you submitted the job. And that's really good for uh, debugging because then you can run your job, see that it fails, run it again, see that it fails, run it again, see that it fails. And so you have that entire uh, allocation for yourself. Uh, it's limited in time, of course. I forget what the uh, maximum is. It's probably a few hours. Oh, I see that Acop raised his hand. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I ask you, yeah. So thank you so much for this uh, valuable information. Actually, just I was wondering if it's possible to interface two programs in Compute Canada. For instance, I'm using a server uh, located at uh, Ottawa U, and I interface MATLAB with a commercial code that is called FICO. It is EM wave code, full wave code. Mm -hmm. And what I do basically, I use MATLAB to control FICO. It goes to FICO, give the order to run. Yeah. It goes to output file, it reads a certain information, so on. So I need this continuous loop to, you know, to go over a long time in order to optimize for some values. I use a genetic algorithm from within MATLAB. Yeah, we actually I stuck with the reality. I stuck with the reality that even though the server I have at Ottawa U, I'm using about 100 gig of RAM and 36 cores, I think, or 32 cores, I don't recall exactly, and the speed is really high. Um, actually, it takes really very long in order to get any optimized value. And if I would like to get, you know, the output of, I mean, or if I wanted to achieve my goals, it could take three, four, six months with this, um, with this race. Yeah, so I was wondering, is it possible either with Compute Canada or any of the facilities that you mentioned that I contact them um, such that I explain to them that I would like to interface MATLAB with another commercial code and just keep them running for a long time with a really a very high computation resources. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a longer question, but hopefully you have you have an answer for it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so both MATLAB and FICO are available on Compute Canada by default already. So you don't really need to install it. And when you say interface, you mean MATLAB and FICO talk to each other, but they're on the same server, right? They talk to each other, yes, as I mentioned. MATLAB yep. sends the command to run a certain one. And from within MATLAB, the genetic algorithm will keep looking at the uh, reflection coefficient from the output file. But you know, it's a, we have chromosomes and generations and all that. Yeah. It's, it's, a long, it's a longer process. Yeah, OK. So you can actually do that. Actually, there is already a research at UOttawa that already does exactly that. Uh, forget the name. But <laughs> uh, yeah, that's definitely possible. Uh, jobs on Compute Canada, they can run up to 28 days. Uh, if you need more, that's also possible. Um, you can talk to me afterwards if you need more than that. <laughs> uh, but oh, they can no. run. Yeah, they can run for 28 days, and you can get, um, depending on how your code works, you can get hundreds of CPUs. Um, if you use Cedar, Cedar actually already comes with a method license, so it doesn't need to talk to the license server at your Ottawa. I'm not entirely sure about FICO, but we can figure that out. I know it's possible because I've done it before. <laughs> so to the okay. answer your question, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, OK, that looks good. So let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah, you need to overestimate um, your resources a bit. So. Like I said, you need to ask for three and a half days if your job runs three days, stuff like that. And then there's also Sauskip. So because Sauskip is a paid service, uh, it means there is less competition for uh, resources. So that means that there will be less jobs in the queue, which means you'll have less wait time. So that's also nice. <laughs> 
So this is the way that you submit jobs. We'll go over this in more detail in the interactive part that comes afterwards. Uh, but this is just to give you a general idea of how it works, how you submit something to uh, the compute cluster. So this is true for both uh, Southscape and Compute Canada. And it can also be true for your own cluster or for a commercial cloud, depending on how it's set up. Uh, it's called Slurm, if you want to know. <laughs> anyway, um, there's a program called sbatch. And that's, you type it in a shell, you type sbat, and then you type the name of a script that you wrote. And that script contains, the first line is always that, um, well, people call it hashtag these days. So hashtag exclamation mark uh, bin bash. And then the next part is a job requirements. Then the next part is a software to load. And then the next part is the actual program to run. So on the right, I have an example from uh, when I was doing my postdoc. Uh, I was numerically creating a, a sample using Julia. So this was the, the script I used. So you can see on the first line, I have my bin bash. Then the next line is these hashtag sbatch commands. So these are commands for the scheduler. And the first one, it specifies my account. So dev URL. Um, it will change uh, depending on your group. Uh, usually there are just one, unless you have what's called a rack allocation. I'll get to that later. Uh, you can have multiple accounts. Uh, so the next line is n tasks. So that's the number of CPUs I would like to use. And in my case, it's eight. Then the next line specifies how much memory I want to use. So this is specified as memory per CPU, uh, 400 megabyte. So I'm asking for eight times 400 is 3.2 gigabyte in total. And then there's the time. So I'm asking for 12 hours, uh, zero minutes and zero seconds. And then there's the next part. Uh, I load the software that I need. So I load the GCC compiler version 7.3. And I load uh, Julia, which is uh, like the scientific computing, sorry, uh, scientific scripting language. It's really quite nice. <laughs> So I load Julia version 1.0.2. Uh, it's actually a rather old version by now, but they keep changing things. So I needed that specific version for my script. And then finally I have uh, my program. So when you start Julia, you say Julia and then the number of processors, then the program you want to run and then some parameters. And the program to run doesn't have to be uh, one command. You can have a whole list of commands that need to be executed in uh, in series. So for instance, I could have had uh, Julia create a sample and then I could have another line underneath it that does something with that sample. Like it uh, calculates the, the firefield electric field if you uh, shine a laser on it, for instance. Um, this is the one of the simplest versions of these job submissions. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can look at uh, docs.computecanada.ca slash wiki slash running jobs. And it has a lot of info about how to submit the jobs. For instance, if you use MPI, uh, there's like a special script there. Uh, sorry, a special example script that you can use uh, to use MPI. Or if you want to use a GPU, there's a special uh, script for that as well. And you can find all of those uh, on that link. Actually, docs.computecan.ca has a lot of information. It's a really good wiki. Often you can just type the name of your program in it. And for instance, MATLAB, you type it in, in the search box and you get all these example scripts on how to run your MATLAB jobs. It's a really good resource. Uh, so that's about uh, the compute clusters. Uh, another service that's offered on uh, Compute Canada, on Saskip, on the commercial clouds, um, is uh, virtual machines. So a virtual machine is a machine that runs on another machine. So you have one big physical server and it's chopped up in little, well, it's virtually chopped up in little machines and you can get access to that machine, but you log into it like it's a physical server. So it's exactly the same. Uh, it's really easy to set up. Um, if you call me, I can uh, go over the steps and you'll have a virtual machine running within 30 minutes. It's really nice. <laughs> uh, you also get your choice of Linux distribution. Uh, it depends a bit 
uh, where you go. Like the commercial clouds will probably have a wider range of Linux distributions than Compute Gamma and Sauskip do. Uh, but there's still quite a bit of choice. For uh, Compute Gamma and Sauskip, you get uh, Ubuntu, you get uh, CentOS, you get uh, Fedora, you get... Uh, there's others too, I don't remember them all. <laughs> and you get different versions of them, of them as well. So Ubuntu, you can get the latest 2004, but you can also get the previous uh, long-term support, which is 1804. Uh, Windows is always a bit difficult. You won't be able to get that with Compute Canada or Sauskip. Well, maybe with Sauskip, uh, but you can get it with the commercial clouds. But even then, uh, it's still preferred to have Linux. For instance, uh, Microsoft, they have their own cloud uh, called Microsoft Azure. And more than half of their virtual machines, they run Linux. So even on Microsoft's cloud, uh, more than the, major the majority still runs uh, Windows. So there's a few use cases for this where you would prefer a virtual machine over just raw compute. Uh, if you want to host a web server with a database underneath, for instance, to collect data in the field or to uh, disseminate your research, or if you have a project that runs a really, really long time. Uh, for instance, you're scraping the web for information, like Twitter or whatever. There's actually a seminar about web scraping coming up in November. Uh, details will be sent out later. <laughs> or if your software uh, requires a GUI, so it must have uh, an interface where you click on buttons with your mouse. It doesn't have like a, a command that you can type. Uh, okay, I see a question from uh, Tanya. Hi, yes, thank you. I'm interested that you mentioned a web server. Uh, yep. I would like to set up a, an ongoing web service, and I didn't think I could do that on Compute Canada or Sauskip. Can I have an ongoing, like, indefinitely, semi-forever web server, or is it a limited time only? No, no, it's uh, indefinite. Well... It's indefinite in the sense that you need to say every year that, yeah, I'm still using this, and then you're good to go. So, That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are two different kinds of virtual machines. You have the persistent ones, and you have uh, the compute ones. So the persistent ones, uh, you can only go up to 25 CPUs. And for the compute ones, you can go up to... 80, I think, something like that. But they're only valid for at most a year and then they'll get shut down. Great, and they could have access to a GPU as well? Uh, yes, that's a new thing, actually. I don't know if it's out of testing yet. I will have to is check. This only... <clears throat> Thank you. Is this, uh, also, is this also true of Compute Canada or only Soscape? Uh Both. Great, thank you. Let's see, I thought I saw another hand go up from Chris, but that disappeared. I think. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions in the chat? No, that looks good. Uh, so use cases, I went through that. Yes, okay. So the nice thing about Compute Can, of course, it's free and that's hard to resist. <laughs> Uh, it's also uh, fairly easy, well, easy to set up compared to other uh, offerings. Uh, they give you access to a web interface called OpenStack, and you click on the button saying, I want this distribution, I want this much CPU, this much memory, and you click launch, and then you wait a minute, and then your machine is up and running, and you can log in, and then you can configure it further just the way you want it to be. So the requirements, sorry, the the specifications I listed here, so 25 CPU, 50 gigabytes of RAM, and 10 terabytes of storage. That's for the persistence, uh, persistent virtual machines. So that's the one that you can uh, renew every year and they'll just keep going. Um, if you want more than that, you can do a, a rack allocation, and that's going to be my next slide. Uh, yeah, also I, talked about that. I will talk about that in my next slide. Uh, there's a link here that you can click to apply for these virtual machines at Compute Canada. So if you go there, uh, there's a link to a form, and then you need to uh, give some arguments as to why you have to have a virtual machine and you cannot just use the Compute Cluster. 
because uh, sometimes people have a software that has both uh, a GUI and a command line version. And when people are more familiar with uh, like the GUI version when you can click on everything, then they might prefer it. But it's usually better to run it on the compute classes instead using the command line version. Uh, just because those machines are more powerful, uh, you get more CPUs, you get more RAM, and you can submit multiple jobs all at once. So if your program has both a GUI and a command line version, I would highly recommend using uh, the command line version as well. Uh, so anyway, if you go to that link and you fill out the form, um, you have to write in some argument as to why you want a virtual machine. It's just one paragraph. It doesn't amount to much. And I can help you with that as well. Let's see, anything else? Yeah, okay, that's so good. So this is uh, the RAC. And RAC stands for Resource Allocation Competition. And it's for those users that need more than the default allocation. So like I mentioned, you get put in uh, the queue and then your job is in the queue until space is available. Uh, there's a bit more to that. It also has priority. So some users have higher priority than others. Uh, the priority is calculated dynamically. So the more jobs you submit, the lower your priority becomes. And this is part of the idea of a fair share. So that means that if you have one researcher submitting 500 jobs, and then another job, a researcher comes along and submits us one job, it wouldn't be really fair that that one researcher with that one job has to wait for all those 500 jobs to be completed. So instead, the person that submitted 500 jobs, their priority decreases a bit, and then the job from that one researcher is only more important, so that gets to go first. Uh, of course, that doesn't work if you have like a big project that just needs a lot of compute. And in that case, you can do the resource allocation competition and you get the higher priority. And it's open now. So the deadline is November 5th. So that's in just over a month. And you, it's basically like a grant proposal. So you say uh, what you need and why you need it. And, but instead of asking for money, you ask for computational resources. And that's not just compute. Uh, it can also be storage. So if you have a project that requires 20, 20 terabytes of storage and you need to analyze that data, then you can also do a rack. Actually, racks for storage are the easiest one to do because there's storage is easier to hand out. Uh, they have info, uh, Compute Can has info sessions about that on October 6th in English and October 7th in French. Uh, the link below there, uh, it takes you to uh, the page with all the information about what you need to do for a rack and it also has the dates for those info sessions and it has a registration link as well. And if you decide to do a rack, uh, I can help you fill it out because there are some technical questions in there uh, and I can help you with that. So uh, the minimum entrance uh, for being allowed to submit a REC application is that you need to use uh, at least 50 core years for a CPU. So a core year is a unit of measure of compute. So it's the number of CPUs times the time that they're running. So 50 core years would be uh, 50 CPUs running 24 seven for an entire year, or it could be 600 CPUs running 24 seven for a month because uh, one twelfth of a year times uh, 600 is also 50 core years. Uh, if you need a lot of GPU, so at least 10, 10 GPU years. So that's again, one GPU, sorry, that's 10 GPUs running 24 seven for an entire year or uh, whatever, at 120, well, you know the calculation. <laughs> um, uh, and if you need uh, a lot of uh, project storage, so you need more than 10 terabytes of store permanent storage. And then there's also nearline storage. So project storage is active storage. So that's storage that you are working on right then. Nearline storage is archival. So if you're done with your project, uh, you store it in nearline storage and then Compute Canada backs it up on tape 
and it's just there forever. Well, almost forever. <laughs> So yeah, I would highly recommend um, applying for the REC uh, if you think you need a lot of compute resources uh, for your projects and yeah, contact me if you need help with that. So that's the last slide for the info session and right on time too. <laughs> so yeah, you can contact me if you need help with Compute Canada or with Sauskip or you need help with programming or you need help with uh, getting virtual machines or physical machines. So that also means that if you have a project that you need a server for, but you don't know exactly what, uh, you can contact me. So really anything that's remotely research related, uh, you can contact me about that. Uh, you can either use our service desk, so I put the link there. You can open a ticket and it will go to me. Uh, or what most people seem to prefer is the email. And if you email me, I'll uh, take care of it. <laughs> so that is the end of the info session. The next part is going to be the interactive part. Uh, but are there any questions about um, Compute Canada or any of this? Let's see. You would kindly send us a copy of the presentation, please. Yes, uh, after this uh, interactive session is complete, uh, I will send out the slides to everyone and then you'll get access to all the links. Uh, the recording will take a bit longer, about a week or so, something, sometimes more. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, I missed a question there. Uh, Chris is asking, what are chances of success for a REC application? That's a very good question. So that depends on what you're asking for. Uh, GPUs are really, really hot commodity right now. Uh, last year, only 20% of what was asked for GPU power was actually granted. Like all these people, um, sorry, all researchers, well, not all researchers, so many researchers these days are doing uh, machine learning. And machine learning can use GPU power like there's no tomorrow. It just gobbles it all up. <laughs> so five times, uh, sorry, there was asked for five times the amount of capacity that Compute Canada had. So if you're asking for GPUs, uh, then it's harder. Uh, normal compute, um, with normal I mean CPU, uh, it's easier. I don't know the stats right now. I mean, there was definitely us more than a Compute Can had available, but it was easier than GPUs by quite a margin. And storage is really easy. Um, storage, you'll probably have like almost certain uh, allocation for that. And the same is true for virtual machines. So if you're asking for a big virtual machine, it's also very likely that you'll be uh, granted the rack. And let's see. Oh, uh, sorry. And otherwise you can go to Sauskip if it's like a commercial uh, endeavor, then you can get access to the GPUs uh, much easier because uh, they have more capacity for that sort of thing. Well, they don't have more capacity, there's less demand for that capacity because you have to uh, apply and pay for it. Mm, let's see. The FEA software Abacus is running by tokens. So do you know how many tokens are available on HVC? Oh, right, they use physical hardware tokens. Uh, I saw something like that come by the other day. Um, I forget how that worked. Um, I will need to get back to you on that. Uh, hardware tokens are going to be difficult. I don't know if they ever found a solution for that because it's not like you can go to any of these compute clusters and just stick in a, uh, a token, but maybe there's some accommodation with Compute Canada that they'll be able to do that. So I will get back to you on that, on that one. Oh, they're not hardware tokens. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I still need to get back to you on that because I have to ask the Compute Canada people uh, how that works. It might actually be in the wiki as well. You can search for Abacus there, but I'll ask. Uh, yeah, so actually that's one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, I am quite integrated with Compute Canada, so uh, I work together with them a fair amount, so I can ask these questions directly to Compute Canada people. 
I mean, you can also email them. It's really just as fast, but <laughs> uh, we're well integrated with Compute Can, is what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Jarno. Uh, this is Tanya. Yep. Uh, if I could return to your, your topic of the RAC, I'm one of those people who unfortunately had their uh, application rejected for mm. GPU uh, <laughs> access. It's, it's a hard going, one. It's yeah. a lot of that. That's right. And I'd like to apply again. But, you know, in the meantime, I haven't been using Compute Canada much, because not because of the uh, amount of GPU time available, but because of its un unpredictability because a lot of my work is preparing for a specific conference deadline, and then all of a sudden I need some predictable access for three weeks, and I can't get that. So I've been working on my own server and just on a commercial cloud server. So, so my question right now is, how important do you think it is, to, you know, when, when making a, a rack um, application, uh, to have a, a demonstrated history of using Compute Canada resources over the last 12 months? Yeah, no, it is definitely taken into account. Uh, I think there's actually a question on application form uh, that asks if you use Compute yes. Canada last time, did you use all of it? And if not, why not? So they... That's right. And I have a why not, but I yeah. don't know if it's <laughs> worth my writing an application this November or whether I should sort of more plan to use, use their resources a lot over the next 12 months and then apply next year. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. a difficult okay. one. It's not a simple question. I'll <laughs> yeah. talk to you. But I just wondered if you had any uh, ideas yeah. about how essential that was. Well, I mean, it depends on how much you're asking for. I and mean, there's uh, the default allocation. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. you might get okay. away with the default allocation. Because if you don't yeah. use okay. a lot in the beginning, then your priority is still quite high. Right. And then mm -hmm. you get okay. a lot at the same time. I might try again. Thank you. Yep, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, beside academic users, oh, beside academia users, is HPC available for NRC researchers? Uh, yes, I think NRC users have access to Compute Can as well. I'm reasonably sure of it. Uh, if you go to the CCDB website, um, oh, I see, I see another question. That's the same. Can government of Canada researchers? have access to UAWU software licenses through Compute Canada. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if NRC has access to Compute Canada. They will for sure if they're cross-appointed with, uh, if, if any researcher in their group is cross-appointed with uh, UAWU, they'll definitely have access to it. I don't know if they have access to on their own. Uh, I can find out and I can uh, send that answer to everybody in the group. So it might be useful for other people. And the other question about access to Ottawa U software licenses uh, for Compute Canada. So I'm not entirely sure what you mean with U Ottawa licenses because U Ottawa doesn't have its own license, uh, its researchers do. So researchers can run their own software license servers and we can connect those to Compute Canada. So in that case, uh, NRC would be able to use that if they have access to Compute Canada. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes, please. Oh, yep. Yeah, for the same uh, for the same um, configuration or the interface I mentioned before between MATLAB and FICO. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that I think um, if one uh, if one's goal is just to generate a database, I don't think the GPU is needed, right? Uh, you just yeah. upload your files, get it run, and wait for the output database output file, and that's it. Yeah. No, I mean it depends on your program. Um, I mean, with MATLAB, you can write programs that use GPUs. Uh, but in, okay. I mean, you probably didn't do that by the sound of it. So in that case, yes, it's just CPUs. So you don't need to worry about uh, GPUs. OK. And at the same time, can I contact you afterward within the upcoming few days? Just because you told me that you did with a researcher who did something similar. 
Yeah. Just because I never ever use a uh, compute Canada in my life. So you may actually just give me a tutorial or just send me a link where I can see how can I upload the job, how can I get an access to a certain directory to, you know, dig for my output files and stuff like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm here for all of you, so <laughs> just email me if any questions for this sort of stuff. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Anything more in the chat? I see two hands up, but those are people that have already answered. Okay, so that's it for the information session. Uh, the next part is going to be the interactive session. So this is where I'm going to uh, guide you through uh, logging into a Compute Canada cluster and how to submit a job. So you can stay around uh, for that if you want. And if you just came for the information session, then thank you for coming. And yeah, please reach out to me if you have any questions uh, whatsoever. <laughs> okay, bye Danya. <laughs> okay, interactive parts. So I sent you the link for um, getting an SSH client if you are on Windows. So I hope everybody has an SSH client uh, available on their computer uh, because you need that for this part of the session. I would also highly recommend that you download the link from, uh, sorry, what did I say? Download the slides from the link I have here at the bottom. So if you go to yarno.ca slash hpc.pdf, uh, you'll get the slides and it will have the Linux commands that you need and the exercises because I will be switching between my terminal and the slides and if I'm in the terminal you can't see the slides so if you've downloaded them then you will still be able to see them so that's kind of nice. <laughs> so I'll give you a few seconds to type yarno.ca slash hpc.pdf Let's see if anything in the chat there Actually, how many people are we still? 14, okay. So yeah, if you have the slides, uh, then we can start uh, connecting. So Compute Canada, they also provide uh, a lot of training resources, which is nice. So I'm able to spin up my own uh, cluster, which is exactly like a Compute Canada cluster. And that's what we're going to use for this session. So if you open your SSH client, if you're on Linux or on macOS, you need to open the terminal program. So let's see. In my case, it's called um, console and there's terminal underneath. Uh, in macOS, I think it's also called terminal. And depending on what Linux you use, it may be called different, but yeah, uh, console it is. So let's see, how do I put that? Oh, I can just put it here, make it a bit bigger. Uh, so you should have a screen like this. Uh, if you use uh, mobile xterm, uh, you need to open a new tab and you should also get a screen like this where you can type commands. So it should just, you should be able to type something in a black screen like this. Uh, I don't run Windows myself, so I don't have actual screenshots for this. So to connect, uh, we have the cluster yarno.c3.ca. And I made a various guest accounts. So the guest, or the user account is user and then some number. So user 01, user 02, user 04, etc. It goes all the way up to user 50. So instead of just handing out uh, user accounts to anybody, just think of a number in your head between one and uh, 50 and just go over that. You may end up in the same account as somebody else, but it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> so to log in, you type SSH, then space, and then your username. So I'll use uh, 01, just to be the first, at yarno.c3.ca. And then I press enter. Oh, sorry, ignore this. Um, I was testing with this cluster before. 
and I forgot that I uh, destroyed it and rebuilt it. So it's saying that uh, the remote server has changed, which is true because I completely broke down that server and made a new one again. So I will remove this from... Okay, let's start again. So we're here. <laughs> we press that. And then it says authenticity of the host cannot be established. And that's true because this is the first time we're connecting to this. So they want to make sure that you're connecting to this server. So you type yes, then enter. And then it says it's permanently added to the list of known hosts. And it's asking for the password. So the password is uh, what I have here, HPC yeah with an exclamation mark and it's case sensitive. Uh, also when you type in passwords, you won't get any outputs. Um, so you just have to type and hope it's correct. So I'm going to type the password, HPC yeah exclamation mark enter. And now I should be logged in. So it should say user and then the number you picked at login one. I will give you a minute to do that. Anybody having trouble with this? I tried a couple of times, I got denied. Can you type in the chat exactly what you typed to log in? Uh, I mean uh, the command, so SSH something something at yarno.c3.c. What did you type? Oh, and if you want, uh, you can also share your screen, but it will be recorded and everybody can see it, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so it's very important this number zero one is a number between uh, zero one and 50 and that should get you in. Actually, I can try with 50. HPC, yeah. Yeah, that works too. They all work, <laughs> for me anyway. Did you get it, yeah? So, Jan, would you like to share your screen so I can see what's going on? Or you'd rather not to be recorded? <laughs> if you want to share your screen, I have to unshare mine and I have to make you presenter, so you'll have to let me know. <laughs> And I can also contact you afterwards and we can go through this. Okay, just let me, give me a minute to unshare myself. And then I will give you sharing rates. Okay, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, I can see it. So you chose user 66. It has to be a number between 0, 1 and 50. So try uh, user 36 or something like that.
let's see, share my screen again. Okay, and I'll continue to the next slide. Uh, let me know if you still have trouble, but that should have worked. <laughs> so the next thing to know is that now you're logged in, uh, you have to know that the Linux file system is different from the Windows file system. Uh, the Mac OS one is similar to Linux because uh, they're both derived from Unix. So the way it works is directories are separated by a, a forward slash. Uh, so it's not a backslash like in Windows. So on the right, I have a, like a little tree of how that looks like. So you have slash, which is the root directory, and then you have home, and then user 01 or user 02 or whatever number you chose. So slash home slash user uh, 01, that could be your home directory. Uh, the root is always uh, slash, so you can see that as uh, C colon backslash in Windows. So that's what the, the file system looks like. And you have all these different uh, subdirectories that are part of the, the Linux file system. So to use this, um, we have a list of commands. So ls, that's a very important one because that lists all the files and directories in your current directory. So when you log in for the first time, you will be in your home directory, which is slash home slash user and then two digits. Uh, CD allows you to change directory. So that allows you to navigate up and down in the directory structure. And if you want to know where you are, you can type uh, PWD, which stands for print working directory. Then we can create new directories with uh, make directory, so mkdir. And you can remove files with uh, rm. So you can see all these commands are just really compressed uh, versions of the words that describe what they do. Uh, if you want to remove a directory, you can use rm uh, slash r, uh, sorry, dash r. Uh, moving is with uh, mv, and moving is the same as renaming a file, so it's the same command. And if you want to copy a file, you can use uh, cp. And if you want to copy a directory, it's cp dash r. So this is a handy list of uh, commands to have. And that's why I asked you also to download the slide so you have this reference. Because we're going to do exercises. <laughs> so using the commands from the previous um, uh, slide, uh, I want you to create a new directory inside of your home directory and then use your own name as the name of the directory. So in my case, I would make a new directory named Yarno. Uh, so I want you to do that uh, using uh, the mkdir command from the previous slide. Then I want you to go into the directory uh, with the change directory command. And then I want you to print the current working directory. So I'll give you uh, two minutes to do that. Maybe I should just put, uh, yeah, this is fine. Okay. Actually, I think I forgot to say one very crucial thing. <laughs> uh, in these commands for change directory and make directory, uh, you put the argument behind it. So if you want to change to a directory called uh, Yarno, you would type cd space Yarno. If you want to create a directory, it would be mkdir space Yarno. I probably should have mentioned that. <laughs> Okay, so I'll do the solution now. So to create a new directory, it's mkdir 
and then journal. And then I want to go into the directory, so it's cd yarno. And you'll notice that the login prompt changes as well, so it changes to yarno now. So this always shows you the current directory you're in, um, but it's only the current folder, it's not the entire structure. So if you type the current, work, current working directory, it will show you the entire absolute path to that directory. So I'm now logged in as user 50. So I have slash home slash user 50 slash yarno. And in your case, PWD should say slash home slash user, whatever digits you chose, and then slash your name. So did that work for everyone? Okay, silence is either good or bad. <laughs> Okay, I'll assume that worked. Or I lost my internet connection. So for editing files, uh, you can edit files uh, from the command line as well. Uh, there are many different uh, versions available. There's uh, Nano, VI, Emacs, and a gazillion others. Uh, we will be using Nano because it's the most user-friendly. Uh, VI and Emacs are more powerful, but they're also harder to learn, so we'll stick to uh, Nano. And to edit the file, you type uh, Nano and then the name of some file that you want to edit. It doesn't have to be an existing file. If the file doesn't exist yet, it will just create a new file for you. Uh, then you can type your stuff, like in a normal text editor. And then to exit, you press uh, Ctrl X for exit, and then it will ask you if you want to save, so you can press Y and then you can confirm the file name. So if I go back to my shell, I want to create some file, you'll get the nano editor. So at the bottom, you see all the shortcuts that you can use. The, the caret symbol here, it stands for control. So control X means exit, control G means help, control O means write out, etc. And you also notice that the mouse doesn't do anything. So it's fully text-based. Your mouse won't do anything in a text uh, editor like this. So then I can type some stuff here. And I'll have to navigate with the arrow keys if I want to go anywhere. Want to go anywhere. Like clicking really doesn't move your cursor anywhere. So Ctrl X to save. It will ask me to save. So yes, it will ask me the file name and then enter. And if I type ls to see my files, I'll have some file here. So I'd like you to try that. So make sure you're still in the directory uh, your name. So in my case, it would be home user 50 Yarno. In your case, it's home user some number and then your name. So yeah, make sure with uh, pwd that you're in the right directory. And I want you to create a new file called hello.txt using the nano editor. Uh, type in the text hello world and then exit and save. And then you can check with ls if your file is there. And I'll give you a minute for that as well. Teams just let me know the recording has started. That's disconcerting. Anyway, I'm making backup recordings, so I'll have a recording no matter what. <laughs> okay, so I hope everybody was able to do that. Um, did anybody have any trouble with that? You can unmute yourself or you can type in the chat, whatever you want. You can also raise your hand, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 
done. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that's what I did before. So nano, and I wanted to create a file called hello.txt. And you type hello world here, and then exit with control X, asking you to save. So Y for yes. And then the file name to write, which is hello.txt. And then there it is, hello.txt. Okay, so now we can navigate, we can edit files, so we're getting somewhere. And the next step is to write scripts, because scripts is what you use to actually submit jobs. So we'll have to know how to write a really small script. And the way that it works is that you have to start with a deadline. So hashtag exclamation mark slash bin slash bash. And that tells uh, Linux that this is uh, what's called a bash script. You don't need to know about bash, it's just uh, the shell that you're currently in. That's what it's called. There are different ones, but we'll use bash. So that's what it needs to start with. So here I have an example. Um, I have my bin bash, so that tells Linux that this is a script. Then I have echo, I'm here. And echo, it uh, prints text to uh, the shell. So if you type echo hello in the shell and you press enter, it will tell, it will say hello back. Then you can put in any command you would like. So here we use pwd just because it prints the current working directory. Uh, if you want to put in comments in your scripts, which is some, sometimes helpful, if you have a longer script and you want to say exactly what this does, then you can put in a comment and you'll notice that this is the same uh, hashtag as in the beginning. It's just that this is a very special comment. Uh, so comments are ignored, so anything that you put in with the hashtag, uh, it's not being interpreted by the shell. Then we have another, another echo that says these files are here, uh, these are the files here, and then I do ls to show the output of the files. So that's uh, a really small shell script. Um, I didn't make that an ex exercise yet because we're going to uh, learn some more commands <laughs> and then we're going to get to that. Uh, so there's more commands, so it's cat, like the animal. <laughs> uh, it's short for concatenate, which is kind of mm, not that intuitive command, but it lets you show the content of a file. So the file hello.txt that we just created, we could show its content with cat without editing it. Uh, there's a more advanced version of that, which is called less. Uh, it shows the same thing, but it gives you more controls, like you can scroll up and down. And very important for this one, press Q to quit. Otherwise, you just seem to be stuck in that program. Uh, another command is chmod, which means uh, change um, what does it stand for? Modifiers, I guess? Not entirely sure what that stands for, but it changes the, the permissions for your script. So if you type csmod uh, plus x and then the name of your script, it will make the script executable. And then if you want to run the script, you have to put in put you have to put in a period slash and then the name of your script. Uh, Linux doesn't see files inside your current directory as programs that it should execute. So you have to be very explicit in that. Uh, that's like a security measure. Uh, otherwise, you could put uh, a file in any more directory called uh, ls, and then you type your command ls, and then it runs that instead of uh, the actual ls command. So you don't want that. That's why you have to be very explicit with uh, running this stuff. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to create a script that navigates to slash home and then shows the files there. So I want you to combine a CD and LS uh, inside a script. So you can follow this recipe here with the bin bash and then you put your commands under there. So this is a bit harder one because also you need to um, make the script executable and run it. So I'll give you two minutes for that one.
Okay, so let's try that one. Oh, oops. That's the one I want. So yeah, we want to create a script. So we need to create a text file that has that script. So we can call it anything we like. Uh, I will call it math home or whatever. And then we're in the text editor where we can write our script. So we always need the bin bash with the hashtag and the exclamation mark. And then we want to write our commands. So we want to navigate to slash home. So cd slash home. And then we want to show the files here. So we show files with ls. And that's all the there was to sorry that was all the commands that we needed for this exercise. Um, we can make our scripts more readable if you put in <laughs> comments if you want. Navigate to home. Uh, show files. So these are just comments. They don't do anything, but they make clear what the script does. So then we save. So we can exit with Ctrl X. It will ask me to save. Yes. And then the file name to write is what I just typed. So if I check with ls now, my nav home is there. So now we have a script here. Um, if we try to execute it without the chmod step, then we get this error. So this is how you execute the script. Uh, period slash nav home. The period means the current directory, so it's current directory slash nav home. Then it says permission denied, which is not really the best error message. Uh, but what this means is that this script does not have execute permissions, so you're not allowed to execute it. So that's what we do with chmod plus x, which means max executable, nav home. You won't see any output. Uh, if there's no output, it means that it was successful. So if I go to nav home again, now it's showing me uh, all of the files in the directory slash home. And slash home contains all the user directories. So these are all the, the guest accounts that I made. So yeah, that was our first script. Is there any questions about that? Or somebody got stuck on something? All right, then next one. So now we know how to write scripts. Uh, we know how to navigate around. And now we're getting into the actual Compute Canada territory. So what we've done before uh, was all purely uh, using the Linux shell and to do the basic things like navigating and running scripts. Uh, but now we're going to learn how to uh, load specific pieces of software that we want. And like I mentioned in the info session, uh, the command for that is uh, module. So module allows you to um, load software and specific versions of what you want. I have a few uh, sample commands here. So if you want to show the currently loaded modules, you can type module list. Uh, by default, you'll already have um, some modules loaded, like you'll have the, the GCC compiler already loaded because that's pretty much always needed. And then we have module spider. So spider, it basically means search. So you can search for certain software. So if you want to use the, the fast Fourier transform libraries, uh, you can use module spider FFTW, and it will list all the versions it has of the FFTW library. So if you need a specific version for your Fourier transforms, you can use that. Although I think FFTW in particular is pretty stable, so you can just use whatever. Uh, if you want to load something, you can do it with module load and then the name of the program. So you can either type module load Python and it will load the latest available version. Or if you want to specify what version you want, you can type Python slash 3.7.4. So then you will really locked into that specific version. Uh, it's nice to lock in a specific version. That way, if you come back to your script like uh, 
six months later or whatever and you try to run it again but in the meantime there's been an upgrade and it loads a new version and everything breaks you may want to avoid that so if you load a specific version then everything will just stay the way it was previously Teams is giving me some error messages about bad connections, so I hope everything is still okay. Anyway, for the next exercise, I want you to use a module to uh, find all the available versions of the compiler GCC. And if you type in your shell just GCC uh, V, uh, without anything behind it, it will show you the version. So GCC space dash V, it shows I currently have uh, 7.3.0. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to use the module command to find all the available versions of GCC, then check the current version, then use module to load the latest version, and then check the version again to see if you have the new version. So I'll just leave it up so you can see the command. No. <laughs> there we go. So I'll give you a minute for that uh, to play around with uh, the module command. You can also type module list to see all the modules that you have. Okay, so let's see. So we're in our shell. We did a GCC V. We saw that the current compiler is 7.3.0. And if we want to see what other compilers are available, we type module spider GCC. And we scroll up a bit. We can see we have very old compilers available and very new compilers. So the current compiler we're using is GCC 7.3.0, but we can see that the compiler 9.1.0 is also available. So we want to load that. So module load GCC 9.1.0. What did I say? 3? 1. 1.0. And it says uh, your versions have been up updated. We went from 7.3 to 9.1. So if I type GCC-V now, it should say GCC version 9.1.0. So we've loaded uh, the new version of the software and now we've got 9.1.0. Uh, and if we check with module list, we can see we have loaded uh, GCC uh, uh, 9.1. <laughs> Does anybody have any trouble with that? So now we come to the submitting of jobs. So we have all the ingredients that we need. We know how to write scripts. Uh, we know how to load software. And um, yeah, that's really all we need. Uh, there's one thing you need to know about the file structure of Compute Canada. 
they have different directories that do different things. So when you log in for the first time, you're in your home directory and the files in your home directory, they will be backed up. So there, that's where you put your files that you want to keep safe. Then there's another directory called Scratch. Uh, Scratch is much, much, much bigger than uh, your home directory. I think the difference is 50 gigabytes for your home directory and 20 terabytes for the Scratch directory. The Scratch directory is also really, really fast. It's way faster than your home directory. So the idea is to submit jobs from that directory Scratch and have them write the output files in there. Uh, it's faster and you have more space. And that way um, your jobs just run faster. And if you want to save your results, then you copy them back to uh, your home directory. So files in the Scratch directory, uh, every month, files older than 60 days get deleted. So you can keep your files on Scratch for two to three months. And after that, they all get deleted. So it's really meant as like temporary storage. It's fast. Uh, your script, your program writes to that. And then when you're done, you copy it to your home directory or you can copy it to your own computer. Uh, then uh, for submitting jobs, you need a submission script. Uh, we just learned how to write a script, so we're going to expand on that. Uh, but the submission script also needs to specify uh, the parameters. So that means you need to specify how many CPUs you need. You need to specify how much memory you need. You need to specify how long it should run. And there are more special cases like I want so many GPUs or um, I want to get an email when it's done or I want to use MPI or I want to use so many different compute nodes with so many CPUs and et cetera, et cetera. You can make it as complicated as, we, you, as you want. Uh, we'll stick to the, the simple stuff. Uh, but first we'll need a program that we can run. So I'd like you to copy this uh, to your home directory. So we're going to create a file. So make sure that you're in your home directory uh, in that directory that you created with your name. So in my case, I'm going to go to uh, slash home slash user 50, I think, slash Jarno. So I'll just show you that. I'll put this out of the way so you can see it. So I type PWD and I need to make sure that I'm home, uh, user, and then two digits and then slash your name. So that's where I need to be for this. Uh, sorry, no, that's wrong. <laughs> I'm falling from my own trap here. Uh, I just told you about the scratch directory and that this, this stuff needs to run from the scratch directory. So what we really want to do is you want to go to the scratch directory. So to, go, to do that, uh, you can follow along with me. So if you type CD uh, without anything, so just CD enter, that returns you to your home directory. You can check with PWD, it should be in slash home user and then those two digits, so without your name. And if you type LS, you should see that you have a scratch directory here. And that's the directory that you need. So we go into that, cd scratch, like that. And our prompt should change to scratch. So then we're going to make another directory here. So mkdir, and you can use your own name again. So I'm using Yarno and I go into that directory. So if I see where I am now, it should say home, user, your two digits, scratch, and then your name. And then we're going to edit the file. Uh, I think I call it my program.py. And then enter. And then we're going to import time, sleep time 30, print F, uh, quotation mark, I am going to sleep for 
then curly bracket sleep time curly bracket close seconds and close all the brackets and quotation marks and then time dot sleep sleep time and then print i am done so yeah i'll give you <laughs> a minute to type this if you're used to programming python this will probably look familiar uh, but if you're not it may look like some magic oh i guess python is fairly readable <laughs> So yeah, this is a small Python program uh, that we're going to run. So this is going to be our, our program that we would like to run. So this is our work. Oh, and this is a, a Python uh, program. It's not a bash script, so we don't have to worry about making it executable and stuff like that. So then we save with Control X. So ask me to save. Yes, why? And then file name to write, which is my program.pi. And if I type ls, my program should be there. Uh, if you remember from a previous slide, you could see the content of a file word cat. So we can do cat my program.py. It should have that content that I just typed. So is anybody still working on this? Okay, looks like we're good. So we have a program to run now. This is a really simple pro it's a really simple Python program. Uh, when you run it, it says I'm going to sleep for 30 seconds. And then it's actually going to sleep for 30 seconds. And when it's done, it's going to print, I'm done. So this is going to be the actual submission script. Uh, this is the example I used earlier in the info session. And we're going to write our own version now. So you have to remember that there are three distinct parts. Well, four, I guess, if you count uh, the bin bash. So you always need to put in this line here. And then we're going to write the sbatch commands that are going to say to the scheduler what we need. Then we have the software that we're going to load. And then we have the actual command that we're going to run. So this is going to be exercise 7. So I want you to create a script called uh, submit.sh. And you have to put it in the same directory as the my program that pilot you just wrote. And I want you to ask for two CPUs, 10 gigabytes of memory, and one minute of runtime. And for the, the account, you can use uh, dev-sponsor00. So that's the account that we're all under. And then I want you to load uh, Python version 3.7.4. And I want you to run the program uh, you created in exercise. Uh, wait, was that an exercise? Oh yeah, that was an exercise. <laughs> I want you to uh, run this program. And I just noticed that I didn't say how to run a Python program. So I'll just put that down here. Uh, to run a program, you would have Python my program.pi. So that's how you write, uh, that's how you run a Python program. So yeah, um, just look at the previous slide. Uh, you can copy most of it, uh, but I want you to modify it so that your submission script does exactly what is here uh, in these slides. 
So asking for CPUs, memory, runtime, and load version of Python 3.7.4, and then run that program uh, using Python myprogram.pi. Yeah, and wait a bit before you submit it because we'll all do that at the same time so you can see how it works with the queue. And I'll give you, oh my goodness, it's already noon almost. Um, yeah, okay, I'll give you <laughs> two and a half minutes for that. Hey, yeah, I know when I run it locally, I have to run Python 3. Yeah, exactly. That's what, um, that's going to be part of why we load uh, version Python. So we're going to load uh, the specific version of Python and then you don't have to use Python 3. Okay, so let's start writing that script. I'll just get rid of that. Make this bigger. Mm, like that, I guess. So I'm going to create a script called submit.sh. And then we start with the bin bash that we always need to do. And then we're going to write the as batch commands. So my account is going to be def sponsor zero zero. And I want two CPUs. And I want one gigabyte of memory in total. I have two CPUs, so this is 500 megabytes. So two times 500 megabytes is one gigabyte. And then I want to time, I said one minute, so zero hours, one minute and zero seconds. So that's all the stuff that we're, oh, it should be end tasks. Um, yeah, so that's all the commands for the scheduler. And then we want to load Python version 3.7.4. So module load Python 3.7.4. And then we want to run the program, Python my program .pi. And if I wrote everything correctly, this should start a job with two CPUs, one gigabyte of memory, for one minute, it loads uh, Python 3.7.4. So the next time we type Python, uh, we will use version 3.7.4. So that was uh, Anthony's comment there. 
uh, and then we run the program. So we save this. Yes. And now we have a file myprogram.pi, which is the program, and we have submit.sh, which is uh, the script. So now we're going to submit these jobs. So you can type all along uh, with me. If you type sbatch submit.sh, uh, you don't need to make it executable. Uh, sbatch takes care of that. So it's sbatch submit.sh, and then when you press enter, it says uh, submitted batch job. And then I will type this command here to see what's in the queue. And I can see other people submitted their jobs as well. So I can see user 49 and user 31. I can see that the job is running, which is the R. And I can see how much time is left on it. There's actually a shortcut for this. If you type SQ, then you only see your own job. And I would recommend using SQ instead of SQ, the long one, because if you do that on Compute Canna, you'll get a list of thousands of jobs that are running and your shell will be spewing text at you for minutes. <laughs> so that's what I've written on this slide here. Um, SQ, it checks in on your job states. And if you submit multiple jobs, it will show you all the jobs. And the format is a bit screwed up right now because my shell is too narrow with this font. So I'll just make it bigger. Oh, my job stopped. <laughs> I will just submit it again. Yeah. So the format is you have your job ID. So for me, it's nine. Uh, before we had other people. So user 49 was running on job four. So that's your job number. Then there's the user account. So I'm on user 50 now. Uh, the main account under which your user account falls. So that would be the account of your PI. Um, then the name. So that's the script that you submitted. ST stands for status. So R means running. Uh, you will often see PD, which means pending. And then there's some stats like time left, number of nodes, number of CPUs, memory, etc., etc. And then when you type LS, there should be a file now called slurm dash and then a number. So that number is uh, your job ID and that's where the output of your job goes in. So if you normally run a program and it writes stuff to the screen, what goes into the screen now goes into that file. So if you use the command cat slurm 5.out, which is the job I submitted first with job number five, it tells you the output of the program. And so that's exactly the text that we told Python to output. If you made any errors in your submission script, uh, they would either show up when you type the sbatch command or they would show up here. So that's the output of your script. Uh, yes, I did that. And one other thing I would like to mention is that you can get an email. Uh, when your job is done or when it starts, which is really nice, especially when you submit a lot of jobs and you have to wait a long time. So you can add uh, these two sbatch commands to your submission script, put in your email address, and then it will tell, um, it, was, it will send an email when the job is starting and it will send an email when the job fails or is done. So I would really recommend uh, putting that in. So that's the tutorial, like you now know how to submit uh, basic jobs to the Compute Canada cluster. And that's uh, the steps you need to take to submit things. If you want to learn more about using the Linux shell, uh, it's much more powerful than just navigating around and uh, starting scripts. Uh, there's a link here that has, uh, it's an eight hour workshop. Sorry, it's a material of an eight hour workshop that tells you how to use uh, the Linux shell more efficiently. And if you want to learn more about uh, submitting jobs, like what other parameters you can use, uh, the Compute Canada Wiki is a really good resource for that. And that's it for me. So I'll just stop sharing here. So are there any questions about all of this? And if you got stuck anywhere along the way, uh, feel free to email me and uh, I'll help you through it. 
Thank you, Yarno. Yeah, you're welcome, Jason. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. And uh, yeah, I'll send the slides out uh, afterwards and then the video will follow oh, much later. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody.